Hey, all you cool cats and kittens, it's your favorite history teacher back at you again with another historical video today, uh, continuing on with our, I'm just going to say Cold War train again, <laughs> choo-choo. Uh, I don't know why I keep uh, comparing these lectures to trains, but hey, we're almost there. We're almost done, and we're nearing the end, people. So again, for your Cold War research project, uh, some of the information provided in today's lectures uh, or future, um, the next couple, um, you may use towards uh, filling out your, filling out, uh, completing your Cold War research project. So, yeah, let's, uh, let's stop wasting time. Let's get into it. Um, I believe this one, I say it optimistically, I believe this uh, lecture is fairly shorter than the last one, um, although we'll see. <laughs> All right. Waiting it for it to prepare. All right. So the Industrialized Economies, Chapter 15, Section 2. All right, so 15-2, uh, that's your warm up. So objectives, you'll be able to analyze the rebuilding process of Western Europe and Japan following the war, discuss the effects of the Marshall Plan and critique the new economic role for the United States that the United States had following World War II. All right, so prosperity, as we talked about last lecture in the previous couple, uh, following World War II, America and the Soviet Union emerged as superpowers, right? Um, so during the post-war decades, American businesses expanded into markets around the globe. The dollar would be the strongest, uh, world's strongest currency. Foreigners are going to flock uh, to invest in American industry and buy U.S. government bonds. Uh, and America's wealth was a model for other democracies and a challenge to the stagnant economies of the communist world. Uh, so here's a little, America's number one, everyone else is number two or lower. Talk about Yeah, America. All right, our, our role. So during the Cold War, the U.S. was a global political leader. The headquarters of the League of Nations had been in uh, neutral Switzerland. So following the end of World War II, the you know, new United Nations, that would be built and headquartered in New York City. In New York. Um, so the economic role played by the U.S. as they remain virtually untouched from the horrendous destruction of World War II, albeit... Um, the attacks on Pearl Harbor, um, it wasn't really on the mainland of, or at least the coasts of uh, the West or the East. So for, that's why I say virtually untouched. Um, nearly, virtually is a bad word. Um, other nations needed American goods and services and foreign trade helped the U.S. achieve a long post-war boom. Uh, the long post-war peace among democratic nations also helped spread this boom worldwide. So you have what's called the World Bank, an international agency that finances world economic development was headquartered in Washington, D.C. And the International Monetary Fund, IMF, which oversaw the finances of the world's nations was also based in Washington, D.C. So, a lot of things are um, in basically like our, our control, right? Um, United Nations is in New York. The IMF and World Bank are also in DC. So where, yeah, yeah, let's just say that. So here's a picture of the World Bank. Like, and then here's a picture of IMF. I don't even know if this is in the IMF building, um, but I assume so because when I Googled the pictures for it, this building came up a lot, but I mean, it kind of looks like a parking garage 
let's be honest. I mean, I know one parking garage has windows, but. All right, booming. Uh, America's economic strength transformed life in the United States. During the 50s and 60s, boom times prevailed in society. Recessions were brief and, uh, and mild, and that's, again, uh, recessions are where uh, the economy shrinks. Although segments of the population were left behind, many Americans prospered in the world's wealthiest economy. Uh, as many more grew affluent, uh, many moved from the cities to the suburbs called suburbaniz suburbanization. And that allowed residents to commute to work via cars. Um, and they also moved to the Sun Belt of the South and West states. Uh, and the Sun Belt is the region of like Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas. I don't I would miss I, I don't know if Mississippi would fall under there. Um, but yeah, so just like that south and southwest uh, part of the nation. Um, and it was uh, very inviting because the availability of AC and irrigation made these warmer climate states desirable. And the popularity of American culture abroad illustrated the influence of the United States. You got movies, television, rock and roll via Elvis Presley. You got Hollywood romances and action movies. The federal government will also help. The, uh, Congress will create programs to help veterans, the elderly, and the poor. Under Eisenhower, um, they will create a massive highway system, which also will make it easier to buy homes because you can travel places outside the city. So your typical, um, the suburbs, um, it is what it is. It's not the city. You have a yard, you have a driveway, one story, one story homes. And uh, it's good to know, good to know. Um, an example is obviously Fremont. You see many of those one story houses around Around the around the city, around the town, and uh, those one-story homes were built around this time, the 1950s and 1960s. So yeah, here's some uh, advertisements. You see, everyone everyone's got a TV in their home, and everyone's sitting around the TV. Can you imagine that? Everyone's sitting around the TV watching the same television program. And then you have here, you got, it's just, yeah, everyone's happy. Oil and our dependence. So America's dependence on the world economy will also bring problems. In the 1970s, there was a political crisis that occurred in the Middle East that led to decreased oil exports to the United States. Oil prices will soar worldwide. Uh, and this is going to lead to uh, people had to wait in long lines for scarce and expensive gasoline. Americans became aware of their dependence on imported oil and on global economic forces. In the US and other industrialized democracies which were more dependent on imported oil, these higher prices for oil left businesses and consumers with less money to spend on other products. The other, the decades of post-war prosperity ended with a serious recession in 1974. And during the 70s and 80s, the world's economies suffered a series of recessions alternating with years of some prosperity back and forth, back and forth. So here's some uh, long gasoline lines. So America's post-war issues, although America as a whole country prospered after World War II, the American promise of equality and opportunity had not yet been fulfilled for ethnic minorities and women. These groups will demand equality over the following decades in the U.S. politics. Uh, liberals and conservatives will offer contrasting programs to increase opportunities for all. So you have the AFAM, African-American struggle. Um, Although slavery had been abolished a century before, many states still denied equality to African-Americans and other minority groups. These groups faced legal segregation, education, and housing. 
Minority groups also face discrimination in jobs and voting. And after World War II, President Harry Truman desegregated the armed forces. And in 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court made a landmark decision in the court case Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, declaring that segregated schools, in fact, uh, separate but not equal. Separate but equal was a false and unconstitutional statement as they were separate, but they were definitely not equal. So here you have some segregation photos, um, especially in the South. Um, you have a white fountain and you have a colored fountain. And I just like to, you know, interpret this picture as like somewhere the water's getting in. This kind of looks like a filtration system. But imagine if uh, this water, you know, like the water, you don't drink all the water that comes out, right? And, you know, sometimes people spit in these water, just, you know, hockaloogie or, you know, dribble. You, you get what I'm saying. Well, think of that like backwash going over here for the, for the African-Americans to have. I don't know what I'm saying. That did not make sense. I'm sorry. Um, civil rights. So by 1956, a gifted preacher, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had emerged as a civil rights, as a leader of the civil rights movement. This movement aimed to extend equal rights to all Americans, especially African Americans. King will organize boycotts and peaceful marches to end segregation in the United States. He gave his famous I Have a Dream speech in 1963 during the March on Washington. Americans of all races joined the movement after that. Uh, their courage in the face of sometimes brutal attacks stirred the nation's conscience as many, I wouldn't say as many attacks, I wouldn't say attacks, but as protests were broken up, uh, this is, you know, uh, the beginnings of media coverage live of, you know, um, hosing down protesters having dogs attack African-Americans in the streets. It was all broadcasted. So the uh, United States Congress outlawed public segregation, protected voting rights, and required equal access to housing and jobs. Poverty, unemployment, and discrimination still plagued many African-Americans, but some would eventually be elected into office or gain top jobs in business and military um, to say that, hey, you know, uh, we can do the same things as white people. Here's Martin Luther King, the March on Washington, just jam-packed, jam-packed. All right, uh, so some flip-flop. Uh, during the 60s, the government further expanded social programs to help the poor and disadvantaged. Under Presidents JFK and LBJ, both Democrats, Congress funded Medicare, providing health care for the elderly and other programs offering housing for the poor. In the 1980s, President Ronald Reagan and the Republican Party called for cutbacks in taxes and government spending. Again, these are two major platforms of conservative Republican Party ideals. They argued that cutting taxes was the best way to improve opportunities for Americans. Congress ended some social programs, reduced government regula regulation of the economy and cut taxes, however, Military spending, because this is still during the Cold War, military spending greatly increased. The combination of increased spending and tax cuts greatly affected the national budget deficit. So to deal with the deficit, Republicans pushed for deeper cuts in social programs, including education, welfare, and environmental protection. All right, enough about, enough about America. So two Germanys. Uh, at the end of World War II, the US, Britain, and France, all democracies occupied the western portion of Germany. Soviet Union occupied eastern Germany. Uh, the goal at the end of the war had been eventually to hold elections throughout Germany for a single German government, but disputes between the Soviet Union and the West led to Germany's split in 1949. West Germany became a member of NATO. East Germany became a member of the Warsaw Pact. Again, Western Germany, democratic, capitalist, Eastern Germany, Communists. The West German economy boomed, the East German economy stagnated. 
Before the Berlin Wall was built, many East Germans would try and flee to West Germany. Um, in 1989, Soviet communism will decline and Germany moved towards reunification. Spoiler alert, uh, it doesn't last. Uh, without Soviet backing, East German communist leaders were unable to maintain control. They were forced to reopen their border in the 1990 German voters approved unification. So rebuilding. Uh, early in the Cold War, the U.S. rushed aid to its former enemy through the Marshall Plan um, and other programs, enemy being Germany. Uh, the aid was to strengthen Western Germany against Eastern Europe, communist Eastern Europe, communist East Germany, whichever you want to call it. So from 1949-1963, you have a man named Conrad Adenauer, was West Germany's chancellor, a.k.a. prime minister. He guided the rebuilding of cities, factories, and trade. Since all the old factories had been destroyed, uh, Germany built a modern and highly productive industrial base. Remember, they're kind of like the industrial and uh, fact factorial factory leaders in, in Europe before um, I would say World War I, right? But um, despite high taxes to pay for the recovery, West Germany still created a booming in industrial economy following World War II. That's Conrad Adenauer. Britain loses its seat. Uh, Britain's economy was slow to recover after the war. Despite aid from the Marshall Plan, Britain, B, could no longer afford a large military presence overseas. Therefore, Britain had to abandon all its colonial empires, their empire, I don't know why I said plural, in the face of demands for independence. Britain's economy will recover during the 50s and 60s. Although it did not enjoy a boom like Germany, the standard of living did improve in Britain. Uh, weakened by war. Uh, most European powers emerged from World War II weakened, like Britain, Belgium, and the Netherlands gave in to demands for their independence for its former colonies. France was forced to abandon its empire after bloody colonial wars in Vietnam and Algeria, and that demoralized the country. Many nations suffered serious wartime damage, like Western Germany. They received aid and via the U.S. and Marshall Plan. I believe this is France. Um, or just... Western Europe, Western democracies. They will build more modern factories and facilities with this aid. Uh, living standards improved for the Dutch, Belgians, French, and Italians. And Spain and Ireland were actually able to attract outside investment that led to economic growth in their countries. Uh, welfare. So during the post-war decades of the 50s and 60s, European countries worked to secure their economic prosperity. European nations expanded social benefits to their citizens and moved toward greater economic cooperation. Many political, many European political parties, especially uh, representing workers, wanted to extend the welfare state. What is a welfare state? A welfare state is where a country that has a market economy has with increased government uh, responsibility for social and economic needs of its people. So the welfare state took root in the 1800s in Germany. Uh, and I don't know why I said and. Uh, maybe your book says where. Um, but that's, for example, like pensions uh, and unemployment insurance, right? Uh, after 1945, European government saw, uh, expanded these social programs. Um, Oh, I forget what MC and P means. Um, oh, I can't think right now. I'm going to say Parliament is P. Um, enjoyed increased national health care, unemployment, and pensions. And again, it's a cushion for the poor. The welfare state had high taxes and more government regulation on enterprises. And in Britain and France, uh, the government took over basic industries like railroads, airlines, and steel manufacturing companies. Uh, conservatism, however, uh, in 1979, British voters turned to the Conservative Party, which denounced the welfare state as costly and inefficient. And they were led by a woman named Margaret Thatcher. Thatcher's government reduced social welfare programs and returned to government-owned industries back to private control. 
Faced with soaring costs, other European nations followed Britain's change during the 80s and 90s. And if you watch the Netflix show The Crown, that which is about England and Queen Elizabeth, um, I forget what season, I think it's like season three, you see Margaret Thatcher. Obviously, as an actor. Uh, she's not. Oh, uh, can't talk today. All right, so come together. Uh, greater government cooperation fueled Europe's economic boom during the 50s and 60s and 1952. West Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, France, and Italy formed the European Coal and Steel Company. This agency established free trade in coal and steel among member states, eliminating tariffs and other barriers which limited trade. In 1957, the same six nations signed a treaty to form the European Economic Community, later known as the European Community. And this organization de uh, were dedicated to establish free trade among member nations for all products. And the European Community worked to gradually end tariffs and allowed workers and capital to move freely across borders. Later, Britain would join the European Community. And if you're thinking, hey, that sounds like the European Union, the EU. Um, you're right. Because the E the EEC, the E E, the E C, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's the European Union where they, you know, use the Euro. Um, and yeah. So post-war Japan under General Douglas MacArthur, the Japanese. Emperor uh, and under their constitution lost all political power. Japan's new constitution set up a parliamentary democracy. Occupational forces uh, uh, also introduced social programs. They opened education system for all people with legal equality for women. There was a sweeping land reform program uh, which bought out large landowners and gave land to the landless farmers. In 1952, the US ended their occupation and signed a peace treaty with Japan. They kept ties close. However, American military forces maintained bases in Japan, which, which in turn uh, were protected by nukes. Uh, that says nukes. It means nukes. I forgot the end. Um, and the two were also trading partners and eventually were competing with each other in the global economy. Hello, Moto. Uh, like Western Europe, Japan achieved an economic miracle between 1950 and 1957. It's GDP, gross domestic product, soared year after year. What is GDP? GDP is the value of all goods and services produced in a nation within a particular year. Japan's success was built on producing goods to export. At first, they will sell textiles, and they're later going to switch to steel and manufacturing. And by the 1970s, Japanese cars, cameras, and TVs found eager buyers on the world market. Soon enough, a wide range of Japanese electronic goods will be competing with Western and especially American products. How'd they do it? Like Germany after World War II, they had to rebuild from scratch, i.e., you know, the nukes being dropped and all the constant bombings of Tokyo. It had successfully industrialized in the past, so it quickly built an efficient mod and modern Factories that outproduced older industries in the West. With the U.S. military protection, Japan spent little military, little military, little money on their own military and could invest in more of its economy. Well, when you don't have to pay uh, to defend yourself and someone else is using their money to protect you, you have you have money on your own. Uh, Japan also benefited from an educated and skilled workforce. Its government protected uh, home businesses by imposing tariffs and regulations that limited imports. Uh, these policies, along with the, quali the quality of Japanese exports, resulted in a trade surplus for Japan, meaning Japan sold more goods overseas than it brought or bought in from other countries. In the 1980s, U.S. manufacturers were angered for what they saw as unfair competition then the U.S. pushed for Japan to open its economy for imports. However, their trade surplus still continued. And I find it uh, a little hypocritical that American business leaders would be upset when, in fact, that was our own doing. 
protecting and building up Japan because we needed a strong democratic force in East Asia and Japan was our West Germany and we helped we helped them rebuild quick um, and when they started competing and you know winning other uh, I don't know how to describe it everyone's buying Japanese products in America rather than American made products that frustrated business leaders in America but it is what it is you can't get mad at them for losing at your own game all right um, I know at the beginning that was a lot of a lot of America but um, hey we finished. That was a kind of a quick lecture. Um, hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, your homework is to do page, what is it? Page 520, three through five. 520, three through five. Uh, if you like that lecture, smash that like button. Help your teacher get to make money on YouTube. <laughs> uh, you don't have to if you don't want to. Anyways, um, as always, Stay safe, wash your hands, peace.